Welcome to the Once in Future Authors Podcast. I'm Stephanie, and I am so delighted today to be joined by author John Ellison, author of Some Kind of Wonderful. In 1967, John Ellison wrote what would become one of the most famous songs in the history of popular music. She's some kind of wonderful. Some kind of the John Ellison story gives readers a unique and detailed glimpse into a life filled with tremendous hardship and violent racism. Born into an impoverished family in a small coal mining town in West Virginia, a young John started on a difficult career path as a musician that would pose unforeseeable challenges. Through it all, John not only survives, but finds love and acceptance and earns a place among his peers as a respected songwriter and performing artist. Please join me in welcoming John Ellison. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Stephanie, for that beautiful introduction. Oh, well, I'm thrilled to have you. Absolutely thrilled. And 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 what a big smile you have. I, I just read about hardship and and racism and clamoring your way up and 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 I just get to see a smiling face. So I absolutely adore that. Thank you so much. How, how does it feel to be uh, not just an author, but I mean, an iconic songwriter, just not a songwriter, but iconic well i um uh, i tell everyone you know uh i just did what god um ordained me to do i followed my dreams and um against all odds you know i i was determined to become a singer and a songwriter i was not planning on working in a coal mine like my father and everyone around me and um so I went for it, and um, I took a leap of leap of faith. Uh, my parents always said that, um, you know, God watches over you, and um, whatever you wanted to do in life, you can do it as long as you be, believed in yourself. And so I made up my mind when I was um, age 13 that this is what I was going to do. Well, I got to tell you, most 13 year olds I know don't know what they're going to do tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree. But, you know, I picked up my I picked up my dad's guitar one day just because he played guitar on the weekends uh, when he wasn't working just for his family enjoyment. And I just said, well, one day I picked it up. I said, let me see if I can play this thing. So I uh, started fiddling around with it. And next thing you know, I was. I was playing it and I thought, wow, this is easy. So I got the bug, as they say, and <laughs> and still still has the bug. That's fabulous. You 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 said, and I, I love the way you phrased it, that you were literally just following the will. You know, that you exactly just, I'm sure though, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe you are just much more faithful than I. Was there a day that you woke up and said, are you sure about this, God? Are you sure? Is this is this the thing? Well, uh, I would say later on in life, because I was facing so much hardship, and, and especially uh, after I wrote the song, Some Kind of Wonderful, and, um, and things did not go quite the way I had envisioned it to go, because of the fact, again, uh, you know, the the racism, uh, the, the discrimination, and not having the same opportunity as white artists. Uh, one day I went into the woods, you know, and I was so frustrated. And um, I, was pr I started praying out loud and I asked God, I said, you know, I have all this talent and um, it looked like there's so many roadblocks in my way. And I said, if you, if there's something else you want me to do, give me some kind of sign because I really can't take this anymore. I mean, it was just uh, like one roadblock after another. Uh, but the signs that was put forth in front of me was don't give up what I'm doing, continue. And, um, and that's what I did. And uh, 
doors opened and and they continued to open and here I am. That's that's amazing. But th th that as much a testament to you for your openness and your listening. I mean, uh, there there's that joke about uh, a, a man who his boat overturns in the ocean and he prays to God to save him and and a helicopter comes by and he says, "No, no, I'm." <laughs> yeah, I know that story. <laughs> you know the story, right? <laughs> yeah, I know the story. <laughs> but you listen. <laughs> You listen, you didn't say, no, no, I'm just waiting for something. When you were given a sign or multiple signs, you picked up on that. And I, I, I just yeah, exactly. love hearing that because too many people, I think, um, think that they're not getting those signs. And I think sometimes their eyes are closed. The, I, I have to agree, Stephanie, because if you, I mean, I, we don't have enough time for me to tell you all the beautiful things that have happened, but I'll tell you something that really is really um, moving is, um, and I'll make it quick. Oh, that's okay. When, uh, in 1974, uh, I had been praying. I, I always, I wanted to go to Europe. I'd never gone to Europe. And um, so I got this opportunity and the, the person that wanted to take me to Yugoslavia, he said to me, he said, you got, he saw my band and he said, you guys can make a lot of money in Yugoslavia. He said, I'd, I'd really like to take you. So I talked to the guys in the band and um, they all said no, because he was not paying their way, paying our way over. Mm. So I so I spoke to my wife. I said, how would you feel if I bought the tickets to go? Uh, I said, the, this person that I met, he's, he, he has assured me that uh, from the first concert that we do, I would get all the money back that I've put in, that I invested in this trip. So she said, sure, let's go. She said, I'd like to go too. Well, we went to, uh, I bought, I bought tickets for everyone in the band. Uh, and the, the person also said, you don't need to bring any instruments because we have all the instruments you need. He said, we have the sound system. He said, all you need to bring is your guitar, your guitars, your bass. He said, but in terms of, the amplification, the sound system, drums, we have all that there. I said, okay. And he said, I also have a gentleman that, a friend of mine that owns a car dealership. He said, you can purchase a vehicle after you get there. And, and instead of renting, you would use this vehicle for six months. And then at the end of the six months, you sell it back to him. So I took enough money to buy a vehicle. Well, when we landed, when we landed in Yugoslavia, and we went to meet this agency. Uh, they were talking in their language. I didn't understand what they were saying. and But you could tell that there was some disagreement. Eventually, the guy turned to me and he says, John, he says, we have a problem. Uh, he said, uh, there is no tour. He said, uh, Tony lied to you. And uh, he said, and what makes things even worse, you don't even have instruments. He said, so uh, you don't have the musical equipment you need to do concerts. He said, I'll do the best I can, but first we, you need to find equipment. Well, I had to go back and tell the guys in the band that uh, there's no tour and we can't tour, we don't have equipment. Well, everybody freaked out except me. I said, okay, God must have, God would not bring me this far for something to happen to me like this. So, we started looking for instruments. We couldn't find any. One week went by, two weeks, three weeks. And then a voice spoke to me and said, John, uh, get in your van and drive. So I told my wife, let's go for a drive. So we went for this long drive in Yugoslavia. I had no idea where I was going. I was just driving. Uh, after about two hours of driving, I turned around. Something said to me, turn around and go back. Well, as soon as I turned around to go back, Within five minutes after I turned around, the van died. It was as if someone reached in and turned the key ignition off. It, the car would not move. I drifted to the side of the highway. There was no houses around, nothing. My wife started crying like a baby, bawling her eyes out. Plus, my wife was pregnant at the time. Oh, no. And, uh, and we couldn't go home. So she was asking, what are we going to do? And I said, look, 
I don't know what we're going to do. I said, but God would not bring me this far and abandon me. What's going to happen? I don't know. I said, something's got to happen. About 11 o'clock that night, I see in my rearview mirror, I see this headlights coming towards me in the distance. Well, it passed by me. It was the big truck. He pulled over on the side of the road. He gets out and he comes back and he says, uh, you have a problem? And I said, yes, my van won't start. I don't know what happened. He said, well, let's see if we can get it started. Well, we couldn't get it started. He said, I can give you a ride wherever you're going. And I said, well, I have my wife and, the, and, the, and my baby. I had a two-year-old daughter with me. So we get in the van, and, and not the van, but we get in this big truck. And as soon as you get in this truck, you know, the lights come on when you open the door. I look in the back of this big truck and it's full of musical equipment. No. Amp amplifiers, drums, sound system, everything you can think of. So I asked the guy, I said, are you guys a band? And he laughed. He said, no. He said, um, uh, we work for a music company and we look for artists that want to tour. And we travel with them and we set up the equipment for them. So that's amazing. I could I, I asked him to repeat it and he said, We look for artists that need instruments and want to tour. <laughs> and I said, Well, I have a, a, a band here for and so he drove us to the hotel. He checked into the hotel. The next morning he called Vienna and said, I found a band that wanted from the US and they want to travel <laughs> and they want to do concerts. They set us up on a tour for the next eight months. Oh my gosh. So I never gave up. And so that's how my whole life has been. Okay, that is the most memorable story I have ever heard that you were actually <laughs> driving the car out for a drive. You just knew, you just knew I'm supposed to go for a drive. And you drove right, the exactly. car out for a drive. That, there was no destination. You were just told. Exactly. To drive. You went out for this drive. The car died. You sat yep. there with a two-year-old and a pregnant wife on the side exactly. of the Exactly. And a truck pulls up in the middle of the night. Five hours after, after five hours, this truck comes by <laughs> with a truck full of, uh, filled with equipment, musical equipment. And it's not even like it's somebody else's equipment or that they're driving to a store to sell the equipment. They were actually wanting to meet up with a band. Exactly. That oh is the truth. <laughs> yeah. That is the God's truth. That's an amazing... I, you better watch out because I'm going to tell like everybody I know I heard this story because you know when you're with people and they say, have you ever heard of a, a story when somebody was really received a message or really intervention? You know, whether this is an intervention. This is like Exactly. An angel. My whole life has been that way. Wow. What a life. What, yeah. what some kind of wonderful. Exactly. That's that's <laughs> just amazing. Well, well, then my question was a moot point because, of course, you're going to keep moving forward with things like that happening to you. Oh, yeah, for sure. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you about your most memorable moment on tour, but besides the angels delivering you all of your equipment, you got a memorable story from, from tour? That's just wild. Well, I would say my most memorable tour um, a performance was in um, the south of France. I, I, I opened for James Brown. Mm. And um, at the end of the concert, when I walked off stage, people continued to scream for John Ellison. They didn't want James Brown. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so the next day, the news in the newspaper, the article, uh, and I kept this article. I have it even today. This was in 2000 and, uh, no, I'm sorry, 2001. I was in the South, of, I think it was 2001. But what what was written was, Although James Brown's name was much larger than my name, it said this concert will only be remembered because of John Ellison. Oh my gosh. 
So I blew the show. I stole the show. Oh, that is amazing. That's like yeah. it's like nowadays the opening act for Taylor Swift, and they remember the opening act. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's how it was. Oh, it, well. it was actually it was in the it was no, it wasn't in two thousand. It was in the nineties. The I don't know ninety ninety five or ninety six somewhere around there. Well, but, I'm surprised you didn't just move to the south of France because you obviously have a huge fan base there. I have a, uh, I have a, not only in France but in Italy as well. I uh, on in 2016 I was put on the front cover of a magazine, uh, a European magazine, and um, uh, because of my performance. Uh, also, um, I think it was 2017. I was in Italy and um, they made a postcard with my picture on it, and it, it's it's called the face of it, Italy. <laughs> and you are the face of Italy. I, yeah, I was the face of Italy. Pizza or a pastry or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I have made my mark in the music world. For sure. I see that. Well, with all this traveling, do you, do you speak all these languages, or how do you get around? No, uh, I can speak a little French. Uh, I learned French because uh, I I've, I did a lot of work with um, a French promoter. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I toured throughout um, the French part of uh, uh, Canada. Oh, okay. You know, yeah, through Quebec, and uh -huh. uh, so so I have uh, I learned probably a little process. <laughs> uh, the fact that you said Quebec instead of Quebec says you've got that French yeah. going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, to yeah. Paul Francais. All absolutely <laughs> that's amazing well tell me a little bit about this book um you know was it was it hard to write was it hard to narrow down the stories did did you have so well, much you know, to write 12 books tell me a little bit about it well i i wrote the book um i decided to write this book because um you know everywhere uh People, it, whenever I talk to someone, they would always, they said, oh, you know, you you have done so well in life. You know, you have uh, you, you really made a name for yourself. And uh, I wanted people to know that, yes, I, I have made a name for myself, but they have no idea the hardships and the, the things that I faced in order to become who I am. And it was not something that was just handed to me. Right. I, I really, I was just determined to um, do something with my life. And uh, I wrote this, I wrote, I wanted to write my autobiography because I wanted people to know things that I encountered in getting to where I, I am today. And I also wa I wanted people to know that uh, everything that you see on this earth came from someone's thought. It came from a dream or uh, an idea. And that um, if you are determined to do something with your life, you can do it, but there will always be obstacles. And I said, you know, uh, I, may, I gave an example once I said, you know, if um, a person came into this room and they were looking for athletes and they said okay how many in here would like to play football i said the ones that wanted to play football would raise your hands i said so after he chooses his team he wouldn't say okay um the first game is in six months so i want to see you on the field he would say okay i've chosen my team tomorrow morning six o'clock in the morning i want you to i want everybody on this field you're gonna do. You're gonna run laps. You're gonna do push-ups. You're gonna. You're gonna get ready for this to become a member of my team. I said some of you will rise to that occasion. I said, but then there will be some of you who, after three or four days, you said, "Oh wow, this is too hard. I can't do this," and you you remain in bed. I said, but the ones that continue to push and push, those are the ones that are going to reap the benefits. I said, so that's how life is. I, I said, God 
chooses people to do something. It's up to you uh, to grasp that. And no matter come hell or high water or how hard it is, you're gonna you're gonna continue to push until you accomplish your goals. So uh, tell me, besides being a musician, are you a motivational speaker? Because you are. Yes. Yes, I okay. uh, I, I just signed a contract with uh, the lady that put me in touch with you. Oh, well, she's a lucky one. That's for sure. You've got some audiences <laughs> that definitely want to hear from you, because I, I love the way yeah. you even just described what really is mindset. You know, so much of yeah. what happens to us is it starts here. Exactly. You know, you know, um, and, and there, there, uh, like I tell people, there will always be obstacles mm -hmm. in life. Uh, but the way to use those obstacles, you use them as stepping stones. I said they're placed in your life for a reason. It's so every time you take a step over that, whatever is blocking you, it, make, it puts you one step higher. Right to your goal. So but you're, you're so right. Other people see those those stones in their path, and they just go back to bed. Yes, exactly. And uh, I was, I mean, when I, I remember when I was a kid, uh, you know, and I, uh, I always questioned things, which would also make my parents very angry mm -hmm. with me, uh, because you know they were born in a time, especially, uh, and so was I. Where you know segregated and in a segregated area, you weren't allowed to do this, you weren't allowed to do that, and I always had a question for. I mean, why can't I do this, and why can't? I? So my parents said, "You just look, shut up, and you do what I tell you to do." <laughs> so uh, I just you know things, some things that just it just didn't seem it wasn't right. right. Uh, for example, I had to walk to school because of the color of my skin while white kids rode the bus. Uh, I um, And in order to get to my school where I went to school when I was uh, like a, in grade school, uh, if I walked in a straight line, I could get to my school within 30 minutes because you could almost, see, but because if I walked in a straight line, I would be walking through a white neighborhood I wasn't allowed to do that. I had to walk oh. all the way around to get, which would take me over an hour to oh. get to school. So I I asked my mom and I said, why is it that I, I got to walk all the way around when I can see the school? And she just, she would say, look, boy, shut up and do what I tell you to do. <laughs> you know, this is. <laughs> well, mom, this is impossible to explain because there's no logical reason. I get that. So, yeah, so that's, you know, that's how you would be absent. You know, if I said, well, this this doesn't seem right. Well, no, you shut up and do what I tell you to do. <laughs> and so, and because I had a, my, a mind of my own, you know, I got in a lot of trouble because of not, I mean, not big trouble, but, you know, yeah, I, I was told, you know, because they would also lay this guilt trip on you um, you could, if you said, if you didn't do what your parents said do, you were being disrespectful and you you were not honoring your parents. Mm -hmm. And they had this, they quoted things from the Bible, disobedience shortens your days, you know. <laughs> uh, it's just as so God didn't like people that disobeyed their parents. Yeah. And so, and so I was always uh, in trouble, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so but you know i mean after i One will. Made, so. well you also <laughs> had a sense of justice i'm hearing in there that you had a sense of inherent justice too and what was yes right. exactly yes uh you know thing and if things weren't right i spoke out about it you know i didn't uh, uh you know i didn't just accept what people said that's right know? we need more people that don't simply accept things because people say it right exactly <laughs> so so important and i uh i have another story for you in terms of me knowing what i wanted to do and 
me having a vision. Uh, I when I left home and I moved to Rochester, New York, uh, I was in this. I had to get a job because I had to feed myself. So I was working in this restaurant, and um, I was mopping the floor. It was in the winter, and these two businessmen came into the into the restaurant while I was mopping. And one said to me, he said, um, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to track up your floor. And I said, oh, don't worry about it, sir. I said, I I'm not here anyway. So he looked at me, he said, pardon me? I said, I'm not here. So he, he said, you're not here? He, he goes, where are you? I said, man, I'm in front of thousands of people singing. I said, I'm on, I'm on stage. <laughs> so, so he looked at his buddy and he, they laughed. He said, well, if you say so, because that's where I was. I was never where I was. I was where I was going. And so, so I lived in the dream. That's, that's a great, that, that should be on like a poster to, <laughs> to be where you want to be. To exactly. Dream. Because that's yep. how you get there, isn't it? If you don't have that vision in your head, if you don't know where it is you want to go, you're not going to get there. Exactly. You're absolutely right. So, and I tell people all the time, I say, you know, everything you see on this earth, somebody thought about it. It came from a vision, a dream. It's a thought. The chair you're sitting in, the shoes you're wearing, you know, everything that you see on this earth, somebody thought about it. And that's why it's on this earth. So. No, that's very true. Nothing would have existed if someone didn't dream about it first. Exactly. Exactly. You know. So. It's got to dream. Well, that's, uh, that's it. Be a dream. I wrote a song. I wrote a song called I'm a Dreamer. It's such a beautiful song. You want me to sing it to you? I do. I was going to just say, I hope you don't mind if I ask you to sing. No, I'm going to sing it. It goes, I'm glad that I'm a dreamer. And I've got dreams to hold on to. As long as I believe, there's nothing I can't achieve. Cause I know dreams do come true. And I'm a true believer that everything that we see came from a dream. As impossible as it might seem, it came from someone like me, who was a dreamer. There was a man who believed he could fly. And this is why there's planes in the sky. He was a dreamer. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> you got a private concert. Oh, I love that. You know, sometimes on the show, because I'm with authors, I'll ask them to read a little passage. Or No, no. You are my first to sing for me. Well. I love that. Yeah, everything I just sang is true. It's a fact. So. That is awesome. Well, you are awesome. I am so, so excited to have had the chance to meet you and to to bring you to our audiences uh just for all of our listeners out there some kind of wonderful the john ellison story you're definitely going to want to snatch this up and if you want him in person i understand now he is absolutely available whether it's for uh musical concerts or if you just want to hear his inspirational thoughts because he has absolutely inspired me. You are just amazing. And I thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Stephanie. And you are an amazing my, interview. My <laughs> pleasure. Thanks so much.